All right, good morning and happy 4th of July weekend. Uh, I don't know what festivities you have, but uh, I pray you have been enjoying yourselves and uh, you'll enjoy yourself tomorrow as you celebrate Independence Day. Uh, But we're here at the Plattsburgh House of Prayer this morning. I want to welcome you guys and welcome those that are joining us online. If you do not know, I am Pastor Jesse, uh, and I believe God has something for us this morning. Amen. Amen. So many times... Uh, Let me put it this way. So many times when I talk about great things, it always starts with because of God. Amen? Because of God. And I want to encourage you this morning that God has some great things for you. The best is yet to come, and it's going to be because of God. Amen? Amen. And in Zechariah, I think it's 10-6, no, 4-6, where he says, not by spirit, not by might. He's talking to Zerubbabel. It's not by your might. It's not by your power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. And I think I got it right there, (laughs) finally. Uh, But I I can't tell you how much surrender means when we want to see the move of God in our lives. Amen. Amen. And today, this morning, is an opportunity for us to surrender. So let's stand to our feet, and we're going to worship Jesus. And I just want to encourage you, in the midst of our, our praise and worship, we're not just singing words. We're declaring who God is and what God is doing in our lives. And I want to encourage you, whatever God has for you, whatever valuable thing that you have in this life, is not going to be because you can do it by your own might or your own power, but it's going to be because of God's spirit moving in your life. So be encouraged this morning. So let's worship the Lord. Amen. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? <laughs> just, uh, Welcome just, a new member to our team. Over yes, we got a new member on our stage. So just give it up for Woo! CJ right now. Make him feel welcomed. Thank you. It's a little nerve-wracking up here sometimes, so, you know, we want to make him feel at home (laughs) and embarrass him a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) Just set your heart to worship this morning. There's something that happens when we just sing. There's something that happens when we praise the Lord. You know, I was thinking about video games <laughs> and how many uh, people have kids that love video games in this room <laughs> and there was always um, sometimes like a cheat code in video games <laughs> and I was just thinking like singing is like a cheat code to go right into the presence of God <laughs> so let's just give it our all this morning and just sing from our hearts for Jesus is worthy Here we go. 
royal priesthood, a holy nation. We want to see you open up the heavens. In this moment, in this moment, we glorify you. With one accord, we've gathered here. We want to see you. name we will win the battle in his name we will change this nation oh heaven fall on us by his spirit we work healing by his spirit we see revival yes heaven
<laughs> Not going to do it. <laughs>
worship you, Lord. All glory, honor, and power to you, Jesus. Praise you, God. Fill us with your spirit today. We sang that. Fill us with your spirit today. Every day we need to get up, put our feet beside the bed, and say, God, come fill us with your spirit today. Because where I'm going, where you're taking me, and who I'm going with, God, I need your spirit today. You know, in the book of Acts, Jesus he raised up all these disciples and gave them all kinds of things and, and, and teachings and tools and tips. But the one thing he said is do nothing until you go and receive the Holy Spirit. So the disciples, they went and they waited around day after day. And, and, and I'm sure some of them said, man, why are we waiting? We, we could be going and doing something. But that's the point. We could do something, but we can't do what we could do with the Spirit of God. We could build our own kingdoms. We could get involved and manipulate things to where we think the outcome should go or what we should get or what we deserve. But without the Spirit, what are we really accomplishing? And that's what Jesus said to his disciples. Go and wait for the Holy Spirit. Because when the Spirit fills you, you're going to begin to do the work of God, not by your might or by your power by his spirit and you're going to begin to accomplish not just things you're going to begin to accomplish eternal things and and I don't know why I'm saying this maybe it's just for me today but I have a feeling there's some of you out there that are that are frustrated and struggling because you've been trying to do something in your own might and power and it's not working out or you haven't got the outcome or whatever it might be and you're frustrated and you're wondering why God why God why God and I want to encourage you today that the spirit of God is for you to carry you to empower you not only to change you, but to change the world you live in. I love that, that song we sang, uh, Heaven Come Down. It says, we will win this battle. By what? Anybody remember what we sang? I barely remember anything. That's why I don't, I'm not up here on the team. As soon as it comes out of my mouth, it's gone. It's like, it's on to the next one. <laughs> we win this battle by your spirit. God, we change this nation by your spirit. Sometimes we need to be reminded that we're, we're here more than just to live for ourselves or to build up our 401k or to, to, to build our, to get somewhere where we're comfortable. Man, you're here. When you encounter God, God loves you so much, he would love to whisk you up to himself so that you could be with him for an eternity. And it burns in my heart, and I'm sure it burns in your heart to be just there. But God left us here for a reason, and it's to change the nation that we live in. It's to change the world that we live in. It's to change our families, our friends, our coworkers, wherever it might be. God has left you here for a reason. So that he could fill you with his spirit, and that you could begin to see an eternal difference in the lives of those around you. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes it's about the next barbecue, right? Which I like barbecues. You can tell I like barbecues. I look forward to those. But we can't lose sight that we're here for a reason. There's a battle to win. And there's a world to change. And some of us are like, well, that's, that's pastor's job. That's so-and-so's job. They're way more talented than me. They have way more gifts and and things that they could do. And I mean, I'm, I'm not really anything. I mean, I'll go to church because I, I love you, Jesus, and I want to grow closer to you. But other than that, I don't really have anything to offer. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You see, you don't have to think you have anything. You don't have to be as gifted as the next guy or as talented as your neighbor, all you have to do is put your feet by your bed say, come fill me, Holy Spirit. Fill me with your
your spirit today. And when you do that, the next step you take, you'll have everything you need to change your family, to change your friends, to change the world you live in. Amen. Some of you need to know that this morning. And I just want to pray, if you will, just let's get our hands up and just open your heart. Father, I pray that Father, that you would easy ease some of our anxiety, God, and that we're not sure what we have to offer. But God says, I didn't call you because you had something for me. I called you because you were a willing vessel that I could fill with my spirit, says the Lord. And because you're here this morning and your heart is open saying, God, I, I don't know what life has for me, but God, I want to be an open vessel. I want to be a vessel that contains the Spirit of God, that lives by your Spirit and changes the world around me, Lord, by your Spirit. And that's all that God has been wanting to hear. And Father, I pray in this moment that you would release your Holy Spirit, God, that they would sense the indwelling, the infilling of your Spirit, God, that, that gives us everything we need for tomorrow and even today. Come, Holy Spirit. Break us free from that anxiety and give us confidence in knowing that, God, you're leading, you're guiding, and it's all by your Spirit, Lord, and we just cooperate with your Spirit. So come, Holy Spirit, a fresh fire, a fresh anointing on us today. Father, as we celebrate Independence Day, let us also celebrate our dependence on your Holy Spirit. We need you. So we invite you in, Holy Spirit. Come fill us today. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Father, I pray that you would just seal this word upon us, God, and that you would fill us with confidence that we would leave this place, not trusting in what we can do, but trusting in what you're about to do, Lord, through us and in us, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I pray you were ministered to. I was. Thank you, Jesus. Who needed that this morning? All right. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. All right, so I have uh, a couple announcements I'm going to make. But one, I want to give a shout-out to Christina Chauvin. Uh, I know she's watching online. She hasn't been able to be with us for a little while now. Uh, yes. So many of us know, know her, and uh, we're friends and family of her. And, and Christina, we're thinking about you. Uh, I'm just so glad that you've been a part of our church family for so many years. Uh, and we're still just thinking of you and praying for you. Uh, and believing for God's best in your life. So, amen. So glad to have uh, Christina just joining us online and uh, being encouraged with the family of God here at P-Hop. Uh, so I do have a couple announcements before I get into the message today. And one of those is we have a church picnic coming up. I don't know if we have that slide so I can get the dates right. July 24th. Uh, we have a church picnic, which is a Sunday, so we'll be leaving from here, from this service, and uh, some of us will be going straight to uh, Sable Point Campground uh, for the picnic. Others might be going home and then heading over, uh, but we will be having that. I wanted to get this date out to you so you could put it in your calendars uh, or your phone, because I know if it doesn't go in my phone, it doesn't happen, right? <laughs> it, just, it just doesn't. So I wanted to get this date to you. And we'll be talking more about it as the day draws closer. But uh, July 24th, we have kind of what we call our church picnic. And really, anybody and everybody's invited. Uh, but it's a time for us to gather together as a church family and just uh, have a barbecue together and fellowship. Uh, we don't always get that time either before or after the service. So I want to encourage you to mark your calendar and come on out for this event. Uh, the second thing that I want to announce, I'm going to announce two things, uh, is our small groups. Our small groups actually start up this week. All right, so some of us are excited, or one of us are excited for our small group. <laughs> uh, Jason says it starts till next week. But uh, 
but we have small groups starting up this week. Uh, so if you're a part of a small group, I want to encourage you to make those uh, meetings. If you haven't, you haven't been able to sign up, you haven't looked to see what's available, or you're just not sure if you want to go yet, I want to be your conscience this morning and say, hey, sign up for a small group and go. Uh, one of the greatest things that we can do, and one of the reasons why, why, uh, why, why God brings us together is because of the relationships that we form as brothers and sisters in Christ actually help to heal us and transform us, right? God is very specific when he talks about his church. And when he says his church, he's talking about a gathering of his believers, right? So there's something about the relationship that we have that helps heal us. And, and I want to encourage you to build those relationships. And one of the ways we do is through small groups, Right? And we have all kinds of small groups available uh, you know, uh, throughout the week and at different times and different places. So check out uh, the small groups. You can go to our website, and you can find those small groups there. Uh, or you can go to our church center app, and uh, the small groups will be there, and you'll see the times and the dates and, and what's going on. Uh, it's still not too late to sign up and go. Even if you miss the first one or two, I still want to encourage you to plug on in uh, and really just grow in your relationship with God and grow in relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Uh, so that starts this week. I'm excited. Uh, got, I got a couple that I'm involved in. So uh, be interested to see uh, some faces that I've known for a long time and hopefully some new faces there as well. So amen. So that's it for announcements. And now we're going to get into our series. How many know what that series is called? Heart after, after God's heart. I don't even know it, right? I'm <laughs> like, heart after God. No, after God's heart. <laughs> uh, after God's heart. Let's pray real quick before we get into it. Father God, I just thank you for uh, everyone that's here and everyone that's watching online. God, you're moving in their lives. Uh, Lord, let us, let, let us never be deceived into thinking that you are stagnant, that you're not moving. That's a lie. Father, you're always moving. Your spirit is always active in, in transforming us and leading us through different circumstances in ways that we would grow in maturity and, and grow in our relationship with you, God. You're always active. God, and I pray that your spirit would be active uh, in this place today and even in the homes or the cars or wherever someone is listening or watching uh, this uh, uh, video, God that you would move upon their hearts by your spirit, God. You're doing something today. Father, I pray that your word would run swiftly and take root, God, that as we go over the word of God, that it would not only just be something we learn in our minds, but it would go deep within us, God, and transform us from the inside out because your word is life and life abundant. So, Father, as we preach your word today father i pray for an anointing upon myself and an anointing upon our ears to to listen and hear and respond in jesus mighty name amen all right so we have been going through a series called after god's heart and it's really a series on the life of david right there is more written on david than anyone else in the Bible, obviously, except Jesus. Jesus is from cover to cover. Uh, so we have all this material that's written about David. And we have to ask the, the question, why? Right? And I, I said this before. It wasn't because when David started or God started talking about David that he, he had too much coffee and he just kind of started rambling on, which I have a habit. If I get a lot of coffee in me, boy, do I become a chatterbox. <laughs> that wasn't the case for God. Right? There is something unique in, in, the, in the life of David that God has for us, right? God wants you and I to learn from David's life. Yes, his successes, and yes, through even his failures, but more importantly, we need to know what made him a man after God's heart. What made him a man after God's heart? own heart. You see, there is a life of deep pleasure and fulfillment that God wants you to have that doesn't come through success and failure. It doesn't come through our successes in God and come through or come uh, or disappear from our failures in God, but rather it really starts right here. 
at the place we call the heart. It starts at the heart level. So we've been looking at the life of David through this context of the heart, right? And that's why we go to 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. It's kind of our, our title scripture. And it reads this. It says, The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. So what does the Lord mean by saying a man after his own heart? Well, being a person after God's own heart means being a person who understands the emotional makeup of the heart of God. I just want to repeat that. If you're taking notes, write that down. Being a person after God's own heart means being a person who understands the emotional makeup of the heart of God. David had a unique understanding of God's love and desire for him. And David's heart response, and really uh, his life was shaped by this understanding. And could it be this is the reason why God talks more about David than anyone else? Could it be that God wants you to have a unique understanding of his love and his desire for you that would so much impact your life that it would change your heart response to God and it would literally shape your life as you live it? Could it be? I believe it is. Now, David became great in the eyes of God, not because of his exploits or even his accomplishments, but because of his unique relationship with God. Now, David writes this in Psalm 103, uh, in verse 4. He says, who redeems? And he's obviously, David, he's talking about the Lord here. He says, who redeems your life from destruction? Who crowned you? And I love how David, he uses this word crown. And he uses this word crown uh, uh, because he's, he's identifying it as the, the ultimate prize. The ultimate honor. Right? So he says, who crowned you? Who crowned you with loving kindness and tender mercies? You see, David knew, and I want you to know, that God crowned you with kindness and tender mercies. He crowned you with kindness and tender mercies. David was crowned king. Yet that wasn't the crown that David valued most. In fact, it's quite amazing how little importance David put on his political crown and his military crown. He didn't talk about it much at all. In fact, I remember watching a documentary on the life of David. How many have seen kind of a documentary on the life of David, whether it's the History Channel or something like that? Well, I was watching this documentary on David uh, through the History Channel, and all they talked about was his incredible military power, right? His incredible military mind, his incredible political might, and his influence that he had over all the surrounding nations, and they're kind of picking apart how incredible David was. But the one thing they didn't put on the History Channel was everything that David talked about, everything that came out of his mouth, everything that flowed from his heart. Because everything that came out of David's mouth revolved around the crown he valued most. And that is the crown of God's loving kindness and the crown of God's tender mercies. And if you were to look at David's life and what came out of his mouth, it was evident what crown David really valued more than anything else. It's as if David was saying, I don't care if I'm king or not. That's cool if I am. I'm all right if it's not. But what I am is a lover of God. And that's what I value most. That's what I value most. You see, David knew he was crowned with so much more than a political crown. He was crowned with kindness and mercy that came from the heart of God. 
And this is what David valued more than anything else. Now, I want us to take a moment and just think about it. What do you value most? Really, what do you do? Maybe take a second. Close your eyes. Just think, what do I value most? Is it about being, becoming something in the eyes of others? Is it about making more money, getting more influence? Is it about getting that ultimate promotion wherever you work? Or is it getting the things others didn't ever think you would get? Is it that military crown? Is it that political crown? You see, what David valued was something that man could not give him, but only God. And he valued it more than anything else. You see, this was the man after God's own heart. The man that responded to the, the, the river of delight that flowed from God. And every time David, he felt that crown on his head or every time he walked by maybe his reflection and he, and he saw the crown that he wore, that symbol of, you know, the, the ultimate place of ambition, right? The ultimate place of, of what others want out of life. Every time he saw that crown, he remembered that his success was not in this, this crown this natural crown that he wore on his head, but rather he knew that it was from God, even as a boy. And that's what we talked about. You see, David valued what God thought more than anything, even as a boy. And as God looked over the earth, not looking at successes or failures, but what was just simply going on in the human heart, and he found a boy named David that understood and knew that God loved him, God desired him. There was a river of delight flowing out of God's heart for him, and it, and it dictated David's response to him. And David began to value more than anything that delight, that love, anything that man could offer him. David defines his life through the crown of steadfast love and mercy. Do we, right? What do you value? What are you valuing right now? What crown are you hoping to see on your head when you look in a mirror someday? Probably for some of us, it's not a crown of loving kindness and tender mercies. But God wants it to be. God wants it to be. That's why gave us, they, God gave us the, the life of David so that we can peer into his life and say, man, this is what he valued. This is what made him a man after God's own heart. And I can have just the same as David had. He's not special. God, it says in his word, he's no respecter of persons. In fact, God wants you to comb through the life of David and begin to implement these things in your own heart. What do you value? Is it the crown of loving kindness and mercy above everything else? Now, David wrote Psalm 18. And the interesting thing for us is, is Psalm 18 was written on the day that Saul, uh, King Saul died. And uh, if you don't know the story of King Saul and David, I encourage you to read it. Uh, pick up a Bible anywhere and read First uh, Samuel, and in, in uh, yes, First Samuel, Second Samuel is good too. But uh, the story of King uh, Saul and and David is found in First Samuel. So go ahead and read that. But uh, in Psalm 18, David writes this on the on the day that King Saul died, and it was really the uh, the day of freedom that came for for David uh, from masses of massive oppression in his political kingdom. Uh, was finally going to be coming. That promise of being king was, was finally coming for David. But this was also written at this very time after 16 months of running from God. Did you know that? 16 months of running from God. You see, David disobeys God by going to Ziklag, which was in the Philistine territory that was uh, under uh, Achish, the king of Gath, which was a, a, a province of the Philistines. So David actually disobeys God by going to Ziklag because God told him to stay in Israel. Stay right here. 
It's going to be hard, but I'm going to watch over you. I'm going to protect you, and you're going to learn some things through this. And it's going to build you up and put, install in your life the things that you need to do what I've called you to do, right? But, but David runs to Ziklag. Now, the Philistines were the enemy of God's people. Think about this for a moment. Right? The Philistines were the enemies of Israelites, and David was one of those. And the Philistines were always trying to destroy God's people. Yet David runs to the Philistines to escape the pressure of life and the persecution of following God's word. Can anyone relate to that? You run to the very thing that seeks to destroy you to escape the pressures of life and the cost of what it means to follow God. I can relate to that. Right? What David doesn't know is that by running to those things, by running to the Philistines, it's ultimately going to destroy him, right? Because we see what begins to unfold in the background, right? Akish is going to bring him in. Now, David's going to have to start killing his own people, and if David doesn't start killing his own people, all of uh, the, the army of the Philistines is right there to kill David and his men. And David begins to realize, man, this this compromise that I've been in is ultimately going to destroy him. And I don't know if he fully realized it or not in that moment. But that's what we do. We run to the, the things that want to destroy us, the things in this life that we think are going to ease the pressure, ease the pain, ease the frustration. But ultimately, it's those things that are going to wind up in maturity destroying us. That's why God asks certain things of you. That's why God has particular ways he wants you to live. You see, if we obey the word of God, then we're going to see the fulfillment of what God has for us, and we're going to be able to instill the things that God needs to instill in us to accomplish the purposes that he put within us. But not David. At this time, he runs. He runs to Ziklag, and he, he finds himself lying, living a life of deceit, and David lives in compromise for 16 months. Come on, 16 months. And this is supposed to be the man after God's own heart. And Satan, I'm sure, says, I don't buy it. David, you're a little hypocrite, right? David, you're a little hypocrite. Now, how many of us say, I, I love you, God? Man, God, I love you. And then in the next moment, we're struggling with sin. And then that enemy, right, that enemy, that devil comes a-knocking and says, I don't buy it. You're a hypocrite. You don't really love God. Well, that's not how God sees it. That is not how God sees it. Sees it. You see, when David writes Psalm 56, he writes it while he was actually in Gath or in Ziklag, realizing he's in compromise. And David writes this in Psalm 56, 8. He says, you number my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? In other words, what he's saying is, God has stored every one of my tears of repentance in his bottle. He has not mocked a single one. He stored them. He has written every tear of repentance in his book. You see, David knew something, and it's what drew him to repentance, even in the middle of compromise. And it's found in the very next verse, in verse 9. He says this, this I know, that God is for me. Amen. This I know. Man, God, I'm struggling. I'm hurting. I'm in pain. God, and I reach for things I should not have reached for. 
But this I know. God, you're for me. You're for me. Even in the middle of his compromise, David still knew and understood that God is for him. God still loved him. God was still his biggest fan. Even while he was in the, in the middle of compromise, even during those 16 months, God was still his biggest fan. God was still in his corner. So David finally, coming to terms with his mistake, finds a way back to Israel. And as he does, news comes. Saul, King Saul is dead. Finally, freedom. And the people want you as king. Right? Right? After 16 months of compromise, this is the, the news he gets after he, he, he repents and he comes back to Israel. And out comes this Psalm 18 that we were talking about. Psalm 18, verse 16, it says, He sent from on high, he took me, and he drew me out of many waters. What does he mean by many waters? Well, by many waters, he's talking about the the 3,000 of Saul's men whose full-time job was to hunt David down and kill him, right? That's a lot of pressure. You have one person, you're you're scared witless. (laughs) Try 3,000. 3,000 men whose full-time job was to hunt David down and kill him. And he's talking about the, the Amalekites and the Philistines and even some of his own men that wanted to kill him. These many waters. And yes, he's even talking about his own sin. His own sin. He drew me out of many waters. And he goes on to verse 19. And in verse 19 it says, He brought me into a broad place. So he pulls him out of the many waters and puts him in a broad place. Now by broad place, he's talking about all all his enemies are subdued and and he's now king. The promise is is starting to be fulfilled in his life. And you know, a broad place is, is putting it lightly if you think about what he's coming out of, right? And why did God do this for David? Why did he do this for you? Because I'm a good person? Because I'm a good person? No. The end of verse 19, he says this. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Come on. Oh. I still get tingles <laughs> just thinking about it. He rescued me because he delights in me. Because God likes me. He did this for one reason. He delights in me. David's answer was, well, because God likes me. And it's like, what? Right? He just spent 16 months in compromise. Surely it was his great mercy. Well, yeah. It's in there, too. But bottom line is God really, really likes me. He delights in me. Do you know God really, really likes you? Do you know that? God really, really, he likes you. He delights in you. And David knew, even in the midst of his compromise, right, that God was for him. In that 16-month period, he was in despair, he was sinning, he was in compromise, he was crying out for deliverance, and God saw it all. He saw everything, and he, and he kept every tear that flowed from David's eyes while he was in the midst of the struggle and kept it in a bottle because it was precious to God. Sometimes we think we're in the middle of sin, we're in the middle of struggle, and the last thing we, that we think is that God actually delights in us, that God actually cares about us, that God actually values us in that moment. But that's the farthest thing from the truth. God it takes every tear that you cry out and stores it. It's valuable to him. And if you look at the end of Psalm 18, in verse 35, David says this, And your gentleness made me great. Oh, come on. Your gentleness made me great. In other words, your gentleness with me, even when I was in sin, is the reason I'll be a great man of God. David is saying, there is a reason why at the end of my life I'll be great. There's a reason I'll be mature. There's a reason I'll slay and defeat the Lord's enemies. 
Why? Because you were gentle with me when I was stumbling. Your gentleness with me is what will make me great. What a sentence. Come on. Your gentleness with me will make me great. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Man, his kindness, his gentleness in the midst of stumbling is something that empowers us to stand up while we're in the midst of our, our sin, in the midst of our stumbling, say, God, I don't want this anymore. I want you. I want what you have for me, God. And I know you're still in my corner. I know you're still for me. I know you still love me. I know you still delight in me. And it leads us to repentance, right? Amen. We can get our worship team up here. We're going to kind of wrap it up. Now David builds on this same thought in Psalm 130. In Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. But it says, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Right? Who could stand? Think about that for a moment. If God held against us every, every sin, every stumble, every moment of weakness, who in this whole planet would be able to stand? Right? Right? In tandem? <laughs> I mean, just think about that for a moment. But he goes on, he, go, he keeps writing, he says, but there is forgiveness with you. There's forgiveness with you. Why? That you may be feared. That you may be held in awe. That you may be respected and honored. So that weak people will Fear the Lord in the days yet to come in their life. That they know they're not defined by their mistake and by their sin. They're defined by who God says they are and what God has for them. You see, you'll never fear the Lord today if God wasn't kind to you five years ago. Every God-fearing man or woman today is someone whose sins were not marked by God five years ago, but rather he forgave them. In his gentleness, he made them a great fearer of God. With the Lord, there is forgiveness so that the immature will fear the Lord one day. The more I experience God's gentleness, the more I experience God's forgiveness, the more awe I have for him. The more I love him, the more I want to know him, the closer I want to be to him. See, God's gentleness makes you great. Now, God is not complacent with sin. It's not what I'm saying. And you need to know that too. God is not complacent with sin. God utterly hates sin. He really does. So God's gentleness is, is not a sign that God's okay with sin. It's a sign that God has victory for you over that sin. That if you'll cling to him, if you'll reach out to him, the spirit of the Lord will give you victory over that sin. It hasn't defined you. It never will. But God has victory for you. Why? Because God is for you. Amen. Even at our worst, and I don't know, my worst is pretty bad. What's your worst? <laughs> even at our worst, even though we find ourselves in the middle of compromise, God is still for you. He's still in your corner. He's still your biggest, biggest fan. And God wants you to know that. You see, God put David's life on display, which I'm sure is quite embarrassing to David. When I get to see David one day, David, he might be like, oh, Jesus, there's not another one. <laughs> but God put David's life on display so that we, could too, we too could understand 
that yes, I'm weak and yes, I fail. And sometimes I find myself in sin, but God still delights in me. He still loves me. He still really likes me. And he wants me. And God wants you to know that. He wants you to live with that mentality. You see, a broken world lives in this idea that God is too far away or they've done too many things to keep them from, from actually experiencing God. And God is saying, no way. Here's David. He probably had more failures than successes, yet he was a man after my own heart because even as a boy, he knew that I loved him, that I really liked him. I liked who I created. I delighted in him. And no matter what mess David found himself in, he stood on the reality that God loves me and that God likes me and that God is for me. And no matter how far I get, I can always turn and find the love and the grace and the mercy of God. So when David looked in the, the mirror and he saw the crown on his head, tears rolled from his eyes and said, my greatest crown, my greatest crown, is the crown of loving kindness from God. And my greatest crown is his tender mercies that found me in the darkest places. That's my greatest crown. That's what I value more than anything that any man on this earth can give me. What do we value? I want to make more money so I can drive a better car so people can see me in it, right? <laughs> is that too honest? <laughs> what do I value? And, and God puts on full display. He says, here's the life of David. I want you to capture what is going on in the heart of David. And I want you to begin to walk by mirrors and look at yourself and begin to say, you know what? I don't value anything that I can get on this earth. I value the very crowns that God can give me. And is that, that is where I find success. That is where I find true fulfillment and enjoyment. God has that for each and every one of you. You are not too far from God. God is for you. Come on, you can clap to that. You can give an amen too. You guys are quiet this morning. You know, plans for barbecues tomorrow. Hmm. David knew it, and it was a part of what made him a man after God's heart. David's most valued crown was God's loving kindness and God's tender mercies. And it's what led him to not only repentance, but to greatness in the eyes of God. To be men and women after God's heart, we need to look at the crowns we value, maybe shifting them to the crowns of his loving kindness of his tender mercies, allowing it to shape our heart responses to him, and allowing it to shape the life we live. Let's stand. Thank you, Jesus. I want to set you free from this orphan mindset that no one wants you, that you're not good enough, that you fail to compare. You see, God delights in you. He really, really likes you. He really does. And I want to fill you with confidence. I want you to grab a hold of what was in the heart of David and say, this is for me. This isn't just for the select few. This isn't for the, the one-off or the super spiritual or the pious or the religious. This is for me. That God really likes me. There's a river that flows from the heart of God that delights in me. And even when I'm at my worst, God is still for me. God is still my biggest fan. God is still in my corner. Let's bow our heads. Father God, I just thank you for your presence in this place today. But God, I thank you for your word that is displayed through the life of David so that we don't have to wander around life wondering how you feel about us, what you think. Am I good enough? Am I not good enough? But God, you, you, you declare through the word of God that I am for you, that I delight in you. I really, really like you. 
And Father, I pray that today that we would begin to be filled with the confidence that God is our corner, no matter where we find ourselves, on the mountaintop or in the valleys low, that God is for me. That God, I can rise up in the midst of anything and know that God is in my corner, that he's there to fill me with his spirit. Through repentance, God, you give me the grace, the power to overcome and have victory over the sin that so easily ensnares me. You see, God's gentleness towards you isn't to confirm you or, or be okay with sin. His gentleness is towards you because he knows that he has victory for you. Don't get trapped there. Don't let it identify, uh, define you. But let the very thing that God has for you define you. The crown of his loving kindness and his loving tender mercies. God, fill us today. Let us sense your closeness. Let it change us, not in what we know, but how we live, God. And Father, let our heart response be different. The next time, God, we are in our, our time of prayer or we find ourselves struggling, we turn to you, God. Let it change our heart response to you, Lord Jesus. And let it change the way we live. Let us realize it's you that makes us great. And it's in your eyes that I find greatness. Let us not value the crowns of this world. Some of us need to just renounce. Like, I, I need to get rid of what I value, what I'm running after, what I'm going after, what I'm trying to hold in my hand. God, we renounce it in the name of Jesus. God, I don't want this. It pales into comparison of what you have for me. And today when I leave these doors and that temptation comes back to value those things, I'm going to rise up by the Spirit of God and say, no, absolutely not. I value the crowns that God gives me. His crowns of loving kindness, His crowns of tender mercies, His crown of delight that's over me the banner of love that flows over my name and over my life. I value that. Fill us, Lord, with confidence and a fresh anointing. Teach us how to take what David displayed and, and let us grab the good things, God. Let us gravitate towards the things that made him a man after God's own heart. Because God, what you have destined for each and every one of us in this place and those watching online is to be a man and a woman after the heart of God. And if we'll bend one knee to you and surrender, God, you'll do just that in each and every one of us. Thank you, Jesus. So Lord, we surrender and we receive your crowns. We receive your love and we receive your delight. And that really sets us free. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to give you the opportunity, if you're someone that came into this place and I mean, you've heard about Jesus or maybe you've gone to church for years and but you've never really saw him as God that delights in you, a God that loves you, a God that wants to be in your life. He wants to be in relationship with you. He wants to, to have you respond to his heart and his heart respond to you. And he wants to forgive you of all the sins that we've groped for trying to run from pressure and persecution. But you've never turned to him and said, Lord, forgive me. I want you in my life. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. If you've never done that, today is the, the perfect day to do that. And it's real simple. Because you know what? God's listening to you right now. He hears the, every heartbeat. And for me, when I, when I was in that place, my heart was going. <laughs> because I knew, man, the Spirit of God, He was saying, Jesse, I want you. I love you. I delight in you. I want you. I want you part of my family. I want to be with you. I want to know you. I want to, I want to walk with you. I want to give you my spirit. I want you to change the world. Me and you. 
And that's what God has for you. And if your heart is, is beating like mine was, that means the Spirit of God is moving in your life. And he's saying, I want you to say yes to this next invitation. And that's to receive the forgiveness that Jesus paid for on the cross and enter into eternal relationship, an eternal relationship with a real and living God all through his son, Jesus. So if that's you today, and if you're watching online and that's you, I, I want you to just shut everything out and, and close your eyes. And how about we all just close our eyes? And if that's you, just get your hand up and say, that's me. That's me. Man, I'm Jesus. I'm saying yes to that invitation this morning. I'm going to give you my life. Thank you, Jesus. See, God sees your hand, even if you're out there on the interwebs. God sees your hand. And let's pray this prayer together. Jesus, I receive your forgiveness. Jesus, I receive your forgiveness. I promise to follow you all the days of my life. Today I receive your Holy Spirit. Today I receive your Holy Spirit. Today I know and understand that I'm not alone. I understand that I'm not alone. But that you actually delight in me. You actually delight in me. And today I'm entering into an eternal relationship. Today I'm entering into an eternal relationship. With you, Lord. With you, Lord. My life is no longer in my hands. But my life is in the hands of God. If you said that prayer, I promise you God has forgiven you for everything. He's pressed delete. And he says, let's start fresh and new today. And remember, I delight in you always. Forever we'll be together. Every morning, let your feet hit the floor asking for his spirit. And I promise you, you'll change the world. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, after our team is done playing, I'm going to be available for prayer. If you need prayer for anything, uh, just come on forward. If you accepted Christ today, I would love to pray with you and encourage you in that decision you made. If you're online and you made that decision, click the link below. Uh, we want to hear from you, pray for you, and send you a gift that's going to help you on your faith journey. And as we end today, remember, we only have one life to live. There's no do-overs. There's no spawn points. We have one life to live. Live it for Jesus, and you'll never, ever be disappointed. Amen. God bless. Enjoy your Independence Day.